Hi, I'm trying something different today and I am recording on my um, laptop instead of my phone because for some reason my phone is really grainy and the images are not very good. Although maybe they've always been like that and I've just never quite realised. Anyway, I thought as well, because I'm so behind on book reviews, like I have like a hundred to do, that I'm just going to do random ones so they'll all be out of order but you know you're gonna have to go with it so i'm going to review this book this was book 22 of 2022 uh, so way ahead of my last one that i uploaded anyway so this one is called the eden project in search of the magical other by james hollis it was um i'm gonna look at my notes as well while i'm doing this it was a fascinating discussion on the psychological reality of relationships um and i think sometimes when people are in relationships it often kind of um passes people by in the sense that people get in a relationship they have difficulties in the relationship they blame it on the person that they're with and then they find somebody new and then almost like repeat those patterns in the next relationship and it takes a few kind of cycles before people become a little bit aware of oh maybe i'm the problem maybe it's something that i'm doing that's causing these difficulties and that maybe i should look at that before i get into another relationship that tends to happen you know quite late on in people's lives this is why i suppose many people have marriages and divorces before they then find um happiness in a relationship with somebody obviously not everybody but it seems to be more more common um so Holly suggests that because he, he's doing this like kind of Jungian perspective, Carl Jung is a, a depth psychologist. He's somebody who believes that our behaviour is very much determined by what's going on in our unconscious, things that we're not really aware of that we've got to actually bring to the surface to you know analyse and understand and, and make changes. So Holly suggests that we have a yearning for an other, and this other can be in various different forms, which is what the book kind of discusses. And um, the reason why we have a yearning for another in, in relationships with others is because it stems from the trauma of birth. So when you were in the womb with your mother, you were connected to another person. And the trauma of being born and being severed from that connection and not having that closeness with another person, you're know, hearing heartbeats and things like that. I mean, there's lots of research that's been done where um when you can hear the heartbeat of another person it, it calms your um autonomic nervous system it's responsible for things like fight flight so and it, you kind of um your brain waves change as well to kind of like almost kind of synchronize with another person which is obviously you know from from being created and, and born and things um it's almost like you, you're trying to get back to that um and so this kind of Holly suggests that we develop an eros to return to um, that kind of connection with another person and, and we almost kind of project that onto finding the beloved so this magical other person that is going to give us everything that, that we want so we almost have this kind of um, yearning for the one for our soulmate who will just know us will just know us inside and out, will know what we really want, what we really need. They can just mind read us and, and be able to give us everything that we kind of want um, and kind of meet our, our deepest psychological needs and, and almost kind of be the good parent to prevent us from any kind of further suffering. Um, and obviously dependent on the quality of your caregiving that you had as a child will depend on um, to what extent you expect that from this this magical other person you know if you felt like you didn't have a responsive caregiver and, and you didn't have somebody that could um you know know you as a person then you will desperately seek that in another person and, and you might be more likely to be romantic and to you know be in search of of the one and and things because you've got a deep need there that you feel that needs satisfying to be recognized and to be known now you know relationships don't work that way you know you you can't expect somebody to just know what you want without communicating it um people can't mind read you can have people who are very intuitive and can kind of maybe guess but they'll never really know exactly what you want unless you tell them um, and you know the people that are quite intuitive and, and can 
kind of mind read a little bit of often suffered trauma in childhood and the reason they're so intuitive is because they were probably around a volatile parent that they had to you know tread on eggshells around to know what mood to be in to respond in a way that kind of met their caregivers needs so intuitive people are often quite damaged from their childhood anyway so uh, you probably don't want somebody that, that is like that because then they've got a lot of healing to do before they can they can become whole enough to be in a relationship that's fully functioning anywhere uh, Holly suggests that we develop kind of um, appropriate personality strategies to to survive. Um, so, for example, we might develop something like productivity, uh, because if we're productive, we are kind of um, defending against the angst of powerlessness. If you can be productive, you can feel a little bit like in power of things. So if that's something that you kind of um, suffered or something that you psychologically um, unconsciously feel, it might manifest in your adult personality as being quite productive so that you can kind of uh, exert some control over kind of what's going on for you. We might also, and I think this is quite a common one that a lot of people tend to do, perhaps more likely women than men, um, is to seek somebody to fix. Um, and the reason why you do this as an adult, so looking for somebody to fix, to you often find um, people who are in kind of caregiving careers like teachers and nurses um they're trying to help because it stems from childhood of kind of almost being relied on to be the person in the family to meet the parents needs to take care of the parent because they weren't really being taken care of by the parent um and hollis is kind of suggesting that if you had a caregiver who wasn't responsive to you in the way that you wanted as a child, obviously our perceptions of being a child are, are different to perhaps what reality was and, and our parents probably would have a very different viewpoint on what happened than, than what we experienced as children because obviously we were very undeveloped in our in our thinking at, at that age. But our kind of you know subjective experiences of that, if we felt like we didn't have a responsive um, caregiver, then we almost look for somebody to fix in the way that we tried to fix our caregiver to be more responsive to us so that this kind of new kind of relationship the person our beloved our magical lover will then be responsive to us it's like we're almost trying to exert the power that we couldn't really quite achieve in childhood but now we're an adult we're thinking that we can do that so it, we're kind of like reliving that um that childhood trauma that kind of patterns that we got from childhood by projecting what's happened in the past onto kind of what's happening in our future relationships and almost reliving that thinking that it's going to be different and it's very unlikely that it is going to be like that just trying to change another person it's not it's not real i just uh <laughs> move the laptop there. um it's not really going to work is it like it, you know you, you can't change another person you have to kind of accept them where they're at and kind of you know work with that uh, we also um in, in that kind of um, same sense there of, of trying to find someone to fix, we're going to be attracted to people that are wounded. We're going to be attracted to people that have problems, that, that need our help. Um, and they could be quite destructive relationships for us, you know, particularly if somebody has like, you know, addiction in kind of some way, you know, you feel like you can be the rescuer in that situation. Um, it's not going to end well for you because you're not choosing someone that's healthy and stable. Um, we might therefore also develop a diminished sense of self um, so so we might choose someone who we know is not going to be there for us um, because you know we don't really respect ourselves and we don't really have this sense of self so we kind of attract to people who yeah won't be there for us and we don't kind of have that standard of well, you do actually need to be there for me in the relationship for it to kind of carry on. Um, so we might, you know, accept relationships that, that are not good for us, that are not kind of um, beneficial for us, but are more beneficial for the other person. Um, we might also, if we feel that our boundaries were intruded on when we were a child. So, for example, if our, if our caregiver didn't really respect us as individuals and kind of treated us as if we were kind of property of them because we were their child. <coughs> excuse me and didn't really respect us as individuals or kind of like I don't know an example might be um if your parent like read your diaries or they kind of came in your room and just kind of like rearranged everything and didn't even ask you if that was okay 
which are distinct memories that I have as a child. Um, as an adult, you become avoidant because you are almost every time somebody kind of tries to get close to you and you feel like they're intruding on your boundaries, you will then kind of um, keep a distance from them because you don't want them to uh, be intrusive. You're kind of keeping that other person at bay because of your experiences in childhood. Now, the suggestion is that we resolve any tensions through a frenzied search for eros and this stable kind of nurturing other person this magical person that we think is going to kind of make us whole and and kind of fix all our kind of unconscious wounds now obviously the suggestion is that we're not aware that we're doing this um but we're doing this you know to, to fix something that we don't realize that we're doing um and obviously we become dismayed because people are human and, and people have their own uh, issues from their childhood that then they bring to the relationship you know you've got two people in a relationship that are probably you know haven't addressed things that have happened to them when they were younger and how that's kind of made them in relationships so then you've got two people trying to figure that out with each other and often at this point people might be like well they're not the one they're not the one for me because you know they don't they don't know my needs they can't um they can't give me what i need they they're obviously not right for me there's obviously somebody else out there that, that is good for me and the search continues and continues and continues and you find people cycling through kind of relationships quite quickly or dating lots of people and never really kind of finding anybody to have a successful relationship with because the issue is not the other person the issue is them that they've not kind of you know looked at their own issues and, and kind of worked through those uh, Holly suggests that romantic lovers kind of um, replaced institutional religion as it becomes like the main focal point of our lives. It's like everything is kind of geared to round, geared to round, geared around romantic love and finding romantic love. You know, the movies and music and kind of, you know, everyone's always asking who you're dating and, and whether you're going to get married and all of that kind of stuff. And romantic relationships tend to have kind of the biggest influence in our lives. They are the most intense relationships that we experience. They, the most exclusive. Um, they they come with kind of rules and expectations, and they're affected by kind of societal expectations as well. And Holly suggests that relationships are really useful for us. They do act as a mirror to show us our true selves because what they do is they activate these complexes that we have from childhood that allow us to kind of analyse them and work through them so that we become more effective in relating to an actual real other person, you know, rather than this magical other that we're kind of searching for. Um, and otherwise, you know, if we didn't have these relationships, we we would, you know, they'd relate they'd stay dormant and we wouldn't be aware of them and, and we'd blame other people for kind of the difficulties that we have in relationships. Essentially, we're looking for this um, this other, this magical other to kind of nurture us and, and make us feel whole because we're trying to avoid the realities of adulthood where we're responsible for everything in our lives and, and we're responsible for for our lives not being what we expect them to be you know when we were children we could blame our parents for our difficulties we could blame them for our circumstances we could you know nothing was our responsibility whereas when you're an adult if your life is crap it's your fault <laughs> because you've not done something about it like you're responsible for what happens to you yeah? and obviously to, there's exceptions to that but largely you know if, if something's not going well for you it's you you need to sort that out um you know you need to do something about that and holly suggests that this kind of over evaluation no over evaluation of the other leads to devaluation of, of yourself um and we're often you know in reality when you fall in love with somebody you're falling in love with um a part of yourself or an aspect of yourself that's reflected back at you Often people who are in love kind of say that um, they like themselves more when they're with that other person that they love. And the reason for that is because that other person is a mirror to show you who you really are. And all the like, obviously, they see all the positives in you and they see all the good things in you and they probably focus more on that. And you're seeing that then in that other person. And it's a little bit narcissistic, isn't it, that, that we, we love that. Like, we like that. We like knowing all the positive parts of ourselves, all the parts of ourselves that are loved by another person so that then we can get in touch with that and love that about ourselves. Now, the difficulties in relationships will arise, according to Hollis, um, if 
you project this hope onto the other person of being this magical lover. And if they're not behaved in the way that you're expecting, so if they're not mind reading, if they're not giving you what you need and meeting those needs for you, um, then people often try to make that other person compliant and they'll do that with actions such as emotional withdrawal so a lot of people will you know if if somebody's done something to them that they feel shouldn't have been done then they might kind of withdraw their kind of love from that person temporarily um, and it's interesting because when you kind of hear that well, when, you know, when I was reading this I was like that's really bad that people do that and I've heard other people, for example, in the staff room at my old work, um, of people saying, oh, they just didn't talk to their partner all day because they'd done something that they were annoyed about. And I was like, that's really bad to do that to somebody for that length of time. But it's quite easy to do. Like when you are upset about something and you, you know, emotions are not rational, your natural thing is to kind of withdraw from that and to kind of be a, a little bit kind of like, oh, I don't want to be nice to that person now because, you know, they, they've hurt me or whatever and you don't want them to repeat that behavior so you don't want to be reinforcing that but really to be kind of emotionally cold to someone who you supposedly love um it's not going to do well for your relationship really um and just because you're wanting them to behave in a certain way you know real love is when you allow the other person to be who they are you know if you think about it when you fall in love with somebody you don't have any control over who they are and how they behave when you first fall in love with them so you obviously were okay with falling in love with them to begin with unless you question that and say like maybe it was idealized or whatever you project in this kind of hope onto them they're going to solve all your problems but um if you start to then kind of mold them into what you find acceptable it's going to damage your relationship down the line because they're going to be the version that you kind of want them to be but that's so that your complexes don't get triggered you don't grow they don't grow because they're stifled into that kind of box that you're putting them into then your relationship will fall apart. Um, Holly's also suggests that we should ask ourselves, what is it that we're asking from this other? Like, what are we wanting them to provide us? Because actually, that is a little hint to us of what we should be providing ourselves. What should we, we be giving ourselves? Because if that other person, if we're expecting them to give it to us, that's what's missing. But it's not their responsibility to give that to us. It's our responsibility to fill that kind of hole for ourselves. So it's a good mirror to kind of show you what is it that you really need and want, and then try to provide that for yourself. Um, love is kind of like a healthy balance between the desire to fuse with that other person, but then also that imperative to separate. If you're kind of enmeshed with another person, it's not really healthy love. Like healthy love is where you're two individuals that come together temporarily and then separate and come together and separate that's kind of a, the natural kind of healthy cycle of a, of a you know a relationship and love by its tension of opposites will help you both to grow because two people coming together who are probably very different in the way that they think in the way that they see things it allows the reflection of the of your self in that other person and this is definitely true for, for me in my relationship. So my partner is very different to me in the way that he thinks and the way that he expresses himself. Like, you know, we joke about it being very, we've got very kind of shared values and, and things that do bring us together, but we are very different. And it allows us to kind of um, come out of our rigid kind of personality, you know, structures to kind of come together in a little bit more of an effective way that benefits us both. So for example, I'm very kind of like, uh, structured in the way that I think, very analytical, very kind of like need a plan, need to know exactly what I'm doing when I'm doing it. Um, whereas my partner's very kind of spontaneous and very kind of like we'll just do whatever, but then sometimes won't get anything done. Um, and so the two of us together means that we can, I can become less rigid and a little bit more spontaneous. He can become a little bit more structured and a little bit more getting stuff done, and then we can both be like. The better versions of ourselves by coming together so tension of opposite often leads to growth you know of both people within a relationship and holly suggests that sometimes in relationships it can actually prevent growth of each other because in order to keep the other person happy you might um kind of you know because of your concern for that other person 
you will use the relationship as a kind of like diversion away from what you really want so you know your soul has things that it demands of you things that you really want to do now i mean i give you an example so say you um you really really want to go traveling you want to travel the world but your partner doesn't want to go traveling now you might decide to be in a relationship with that person um and not go traveling now what you're doing there is you are annihilating your self-interest for the concern of that other person and i mean your your self-interest might be that you do actually want that relationship you do want to be with that person so obviously there is that as well but if you continue to be in that relationship with that person eventually you will become resentful of the fact that you didn't go and do the traveling that you needed to do because you sacrifice that for the relationship but then really you're sacrificing parts of yourself and part of what your soul kind of needs so you should really come to some kind of solution where you could perhaps have both if that's what you want but you can't completely annihilate what you want to do like what your soul kind of demands of you like you need to go and do that otherwise you're not going to be a fully functioning healthy person and holly suggests that often people are stuck at their own level of wounding so people might manage their fear in ways that manifest as hostility and in interactions with others or passive aggressiveness or um, like covertly avoiding the activation of the other's power um, emotional hiding refusal to share kind of oneself with another um, in the sense of you know not being vulnerable not being open because you don't want to give that other person um, power over you um, you know you might seek external validation because you you don't really know what you want you're not really quite sure what's felt within i know a few people that um they don't they're not really in touch with what's inside and, and their own intuition because they don't spend a lot of time in solitude they're around people all the time and they love being around people and it and it's an avoidance from hurt and maybe depression and things like that so they're always around people and they always want to be around people but they don't really heal those wounds and reflect on that and they don't listen to their intuition i think it is something that develops with age but it's something that people that that don't have that intuition will seek external validation they'll very much care about what other people think about them they'll really think that other people's um, opinions are things to listen to and things to kind of make the decisions their life decisions by so they might ask their parents and they might ask their partner and they might ask you know people that they respect what they think and they'll base their kind of decisions on what they think and so they'll tend to flip flop around with the decisions because they've they've not got that kind of anchoring of what they actually want to do whereas for me i've always kind of had a really good kind of um intuition of what i want to do like i just know it's just feeling inside i just know i just know what i want to do what i don't want to do like it's just there and i think it's because i'm so in touch with myself and who i am inside that you know i spend a lot of time on my own and i love it like i absolutely love it i'm not trying to escape from myself like i know myself i like myself i just have that intuition i just i just know and i, and I, I do recommend go traveling on your own without contacting anybody for days and weeks and whatever and, and see see how it changes you for the better it is it is very good for you to do that um another thing that people might do is they might try to provoke another to anger just so that they can then experience their own emotional reality so they might be quite dead to emotion so they kind of push other people's buttons so that then they can feel something because they're quite numb inside it kind of explains why certain people behave in the way that they do particularly in relationships where it can, it can be quite volatile sometimes so when these kind of complexes surface and we have kind of an intense effective response that so we might get very upset very angry um we tend to kind of like ignore these signals from the psyche um because we're like oh yeah you know it's nothing to do with me or whatever it's to the person that's kind of like uh, affecting me and what tends to happen then is you start to get physical ailments so you get the body is very clever in that it gives you signals it gives you kind of things that are wrong that it wants you to kind of fix so it'll tell you thoughts and things and you know it'll make you depressed which is a signal that something's not right that you need to change but if you ignore that 
you then start to get ill and you start to get kind of like chest pains and you start to get rapid heartbeat and you start to get kind of more colds and and things like that just so that you will pay attention to the fact that you're not doing what's in your best interest so the physical ailments will begin Um, and they provide us with an opportunity to change and obviously relinquish this expectation of rescue from the other and replace these expectations with hope so the idea is that you will eventually realize that this other person can't heal you and can't bring you what you need but this is good because then you you know you can rescue yourself like you can do these things for yourself you don't need another person to do this and you can actually begin to share with the other the best person that you can be and you can value and celebrate their otherness this is something that i've really learned with my current partner um because he's so different when we first got together it's almost like i wanted him to be like me I wanted him to slot in with my way of doing things so that it wouldn't be anxiety provoking and, and, you know, wouldn't be difficult for me. Um, But actually, he brings so much to my life that I wouldn't have if he wasn't as different as he is. And so, you know, we just accept now that I'm very good at certain things. So, for example, I'm very good at navigation, very good at logistics. He's very good at talking to other people and, you know, charming waitress waiter staff people service people um you know so we have our roles in the relationship and and they work more to our personalities um and we celebrate that otherness rather than you know i was always kind of getting really annoyed that i was always the one that had to navigate everywhere but actually i'm better at it so i should do that and then he brings you know his other things to the relationship it's kind of like celebrating that otherness celebrating that different way of seeing things that different kind of perspective that different way of of communicating and and living our lives and you know coming to some kind of balance in between the two is often useful for the both of us because it helps us to grow all this suggests as well that relationships challenge to grow up and to you know take responsibility and become an adult um those that hurt you most actually lead to the transformation of a psychologically healthy adult like you need to be hurt you needed all those kind of challenges and those kind of difficulties in order to become an adult who's psychologically healthy that's dealt with all these complexes that arise and you know they would never have been aware to you if you hadn't been triggered by somebody else so always look at kind of people around you in your life who are are triggering you as signals to help you work on things that that are kind of um what's the, like sores like like um oh i can't remember the actual kind of terminology for it i remember it like a quote that somebody said but if you've got kind of um you know spots that people are triggering it's because they're things that you haven't healed yet because if you had healed you wouldn't be bothered by those things you wouldn't be triggered in that way so it's kind of like alerting you to what you still need to work on so hollis discusses the need to become conscious of our childhood histories um it gives lots of examples of different people so one was a man who had an unmet need for unconditional acceptance in childhood which i think is something that a lot of people have you know when you've not been fully accepted for who you are um because you're maybe you're different to your family because of generational differences and educational differences and things like that you know things change don't they so that you become a little bit different to your kind of family of origin um and what this this led to is that this man had great worldly achievement because he unconsciously felt like he did not meet the requirement for love just by being himself and it's interesting actually because i feel like i had this when i was much younger um i didn't really feel like i mean obviously this, this is unconscious like i don't think i was ever really aware that this is what i was doing but i was always trying to achieve things because you know in my family when i achieved things i got lots of praise and credit for that whereas i didn't really feel kind of i suppose loved for just who i was i was loved more for when i was achieving things so i feel like that meant me achieving more and more and more it was getting me more of that kind of praise um but then not really kind of feeling but i mean did i feel i don't think i ever kind of consciously felt like i wasn't enough 
I don't think that was ever a thought process because I was always liked myself. I always thought that, you know, I was great and stuff. I didn't really, you didn't really have any of that kind of like worry, that teenage angst that many people have. I mean, I've had that more as I've become an adult and become a little bit more self-aware, I suppose. I was still like egocentric and looking at things from my own viewpoint. I don't think I ever really kind of considered other people's kind of views of me, really. Um, it was more that than, you know, not being kind of bothered or whatever. Um so anyway, with this this man who who was having this worldly achievement, it manifested in him as a fear of powerlessness and a, a regression. So he ended up dating a younger woman. Um, so he sought out his own emotional level um, and paid no attention to the development of his anima. So Jung suggests that we've got archetypes, male and female archetypes. We've got an animus and an anima. So anima is the kind of female archetype um, in the person's personality. It's interesting, actually, because I... I'm dating somebody who is younger than me so maybe this is like me like maybe this is why I wrote it in my review because it resonated so much with me um you know perhaps this this emotional development didn't happen until until very recently um another example that Holly suggests is a child who had to take responsibility for the feeling state of the other so um the other can be like a parent as well like a caregiver so you're kind of almost like transferring what was the caregiver onto your romantic partner, which becomes the magical other. Um, so this child became a parentified child. Again, this happens very often with children as well. If they are spoken to in a way that, I mean, for example, if you've got a parent who used to talk to you as an adult and would disclose things about their lives and their friendships, for example, in a way that they should really be doing with their own friend and not with you as a child, you becoming a parentified child because you're providing that parent with emotional support that they really should be getting from a friend and instead they're seeking it from their child and then that's affecting the emotional growth of the child because then they're not emotionally ready to deal with that like they should be spoken to like a child really um so anyway this manifests in this person as them making self-constrictive choices um because obviously they're caring for the parent and the parent's needs. Another example was a man with an emotionally stunted mother uh, led to a pull towards emotionally needy women who wanted a caretaker. Um, so, you know, if you had to kind of caretake your parent, then you will probably be drawn towards people in relationships that are quite emotionally needy. Um, so Hollis talks of the separation between conscious clarity of these complexes and the angst that they may be activated through the encounter with this primal other. So I used an example, um, I used an example of a woman who was overwhelmed with anxiety at setting boundaries. And this was because she had quite an intrusive child experience or experiences. Um, so, you know, if you've got like a parent who I've mentioned this previously, who was always kind of intruding on your boundaries and not really allowing you to say no or say that, that I, I don't really want you to do that and they just kind of didn't listen um then this means that you can't really say no in adulthood it becomes quite difficult and although you might be kind of like a, a rational adult person normally when it comes to those relationships with either your parents or um in a relationship you regress back into that childhood state and you you feel that kind of anxiety so in the case of this woman when she was trying to set boundaries you know she was articulate enough to do it in the first stage but then as soon as it was challenged the collapse resolved so in response to the challenge she couldn't set boundaries and this is a common thing as well with people who aren't used to setting boundaries because they, they weren't allowed to do so in childhood um they, they can say it at first and then when someone challenges it they're like oh no no that's fine or they'll kind of change the mind or whatever um, boundaries is something that I definitely have to work on as an adult and I'm I'm a lot better at it now than than I used to be um but even when I do it now I still feel guilty afterwards I still feel guilty for separate uh, for setting boundaries and for doing what I want and I always have a little bit of self-doubt is this really what I want like do can I compromise with the other person I have to stop myself and go no your initial response to that was this that this is what you wanted to do that's what you said initially stick with that and I have to really be quite firm with myself in that because I do find that a lot of people will intrude on your boundaries if you don't set them because people want, want what they want like they don't you know even though they're being kind of uh, they're not being horrible but they everyone's acting in their own self-interest ultimately and so 
if you're someone who's always acting in other people's interest, then you will get trodden on a lot. So you have to kind of stick up for yourself. You have to set those boundaries and you have to kind of stay firm with those and, and kind of deal with that kind of guilt that you probably had from childhood because you were made to feel guilty for wanting something other than what your parents wanted. Now, Hollis also discusses the folly of bringing the needs of the soul um, to work. So a lot of people today, particularly today's day and age um the youth of today will look to the workplace for um a meeting of all their needs so and in fact holly says a really really good quote he says um people are trying to find fulfillment from something that does not love you and rents your behavior only as long as it, it is productive and makes money for the corporation you know essentially people pay you to do a job they're renting your behavior for as long as you're productive as soon as you're not doing what that company wants as soon as you're not productive as soon as you um don't agree with their aims don't agree with their values bye they can find somebody else to replace you um you know work is not there to meet your needs like it never was like that's not the purpose of of employment or it, at least it wasn't uh, maybe it's changing now because of these demands that people are, are projecting onto the workplace but essentially a job is just there to give you money and for them to get your behavior to do their aims um now the expectation that a company is going to meet your emotional needs by giving you power by giving you wisdom by having a kind of nurturing intent so you know to look after you and to help you with the career and help you kind of climb that that corporate ladder um it's it's a projection of what we expected from a parent and it'll only lead you to your own kind of um well-being being sacrificed in the service of this other because you think that you're trading you know you're self-sacrificing um for this kind of things that you want in back so to kind of you know all the things just previously mentioned but that trade was never offered to you you know the workplace did not offer you that trade you're just expecting that they're going to give you that if you self-sacrifice and it's interesting because when i first started working in my chosen career i was very happy that i found a career that i, that I loved and that i wanted to do and i was very much self-sacrificing to the company i was working at a detriment to my own health mental and physical i got very very unwell from working ridiculous hours for a job that i wasn't even really enjoying towards the end because it was so draining and so exhausting um and it had its many problems but anyway i was really thinking that the company would care about me and would care about me as an individual and would care about uh, my achievements and would recognize me for achieving things and would give me a promotion if I did good work like these were all the things that I was expecting from the company and it took me a very long time to realize that I was a number and I was easily replaceable and if I didn't want to toe the party line and I didn't want to you know do all the things that they were all passionate about in the company then I had to leave and find somewhere else and find a better fit somewhere else and so it's really changed my perspective on work in the sense that you need to give the company what they want if you want to do well at that company like you have to do that and that might mean that you sacrifice parts of yourself and your identity um which i personally wasn't willing to do um which is why i left but i imagine i can understand now why people do it or maybe people do it with not needing to sacrifice parts of themselves and that's why they do so well in these companies because they're not actually sacrificing anything they're, they're doing it for the good of themselves and, and you know the, the company um holly suggests that depression is the suppression of one's own calling and neurosis is symptomatic of reduced vision of life and a worldview of insufficient amplitude that has been sacrificed to avoid the difficulty of becoming an adult what you're doing in a workplace when you expect them to meet all your emotional needs is you're remaining a child you're expecting that things will be handed to you on a plate as they were in childhood um, and you avoid the difficulty of growing up and being an adult 
by projecting your needs onto that company so you become very dissatisfied working for companies because they don't provide you with what you want but they don't they never agreed to that trade um, and so you will probably become depressed because you're suppressing what you're actually wanting to do you know the, the growing up and the, the kind of you know what is it that you actually want go and do it like you're suppressing that because you're, you're waiting for somebody to give you a promotion for example rather than go and get it yourself um you know it was very clear to me in my company that there weren't any opportunities for progression at that particular time all the the leaders ship roles were filled by people quite recently no one was moving on etc etc at that point i should have done the adult thing and worked elsewhere where there were opportunities for progression and instead i stayed and got resentful at the company for not promoting me and left at a time when lots of people were then becoming promoted because there's lots of things opening up and things were changing and if i'd have stayed i probably would have got promoted and would have had better opportunities but I, I suppose at the time as well, I'd seen other people who had been downtrodden and had been kind of overlooked for promotions when they should have been given them and so on and so forth. So maybe it was just not a good company, but I can see this kind of playing out in my own kind of experience. And I imagine it's quite common for kind of other people as well. So what Hollis is suggesting is that we should really cultivate this kind of... Um, need in our relationships with other people otherwise we'll get quite cynical and have long morale well at work um because the psychic burden of an institution is an expression of where its leadership is personally blocked so hollis also suggests that um companies sometimes are not effective because the leaders within the, the team are blocked psychologically at certain levels and so it won't kind of meet the needs that you're wanting because you know it, people can only operate at the level that they're at but it's interesting when i think about like my old workplace um the people in my department were very resentful of anybody who was kind of like very innovative with the with the job role um and anybody who was kind of like wanting to improve and, and do well they were quite resentful of that and so it if I was trying to do that, they were quite resentful of me. And it was kind of like a really difficult place to get my needs met in that respect because they were all blocked at that kind of level. Um, Hollis also discusses the projection of the other onto religion, where again, um, there's an abortion of personal growth. So in a similar way to kind of work, you're almost kind of like um, avoiding adulthood, avoiding growing up and making your own beliefs and things like that because you are um having this kind of magical other of uh you know whatever deity deity um the religion purports to be based on and they then become the person that is supposed to be meeting all your kind of emotional needs um rather than you kind of meeting them yourself so it's a similar kind of uh, metaphor there uh, well, not a metaphor, but a similar projection um, of this kind of wanting somebody else to take responsibility for your life. You know, religions often have um, scripture, ways of doing things, you know, rules, regulations, rituals, whatever it is. Uh, and by following those, you abdicate your own personal responsibility because you do what's being told for you to do rather than you making your own personal choices. I always think of it being more psychologically healthy if you are believed in the religion to pick and choose the bits of it which suit you the most in terms of your personal growth i don't believe in this kind of absolutist kind of you should accept the entirety of something um particularly if it doesn't serve you as an individual and it restricts your growth um hollis concludes by suggesting that the health of a society depends on evolved adults and if we live a solitary life, we can come to think that the whole cosmos is only what we think it to be. So we really need relationships with other people to understand what is important in life and in what ways we kind of need to grow to evolve, to be fully functioning adults. I think there's a lot of people in today's society that will avoid this kind of growing up. And it is systemic and it's because of things like, you know, not being able to afford a mortgage in a house, kind of like that. But I mean that's kind of like an adulthood kind of view in just material terms but psychological terms in kind of you know people 
understanding how to communicate with another person without kind of being hostile towards them and just things like that where they they accept the other person as being different and having a different perspective and you know they're not kind of like polarized by views and stuff like that you know society's health depends on that and i think today society is quite sick in the mind of just believing your own viewpoint and being your own echo chamber and not kind of you know trying to evolve and be a better person people are very stuck at the kind of level of wounding as always suggest um it takes a lot of courage to be solely responsible for ourselves and often we avoid that and we project the responsibility of ourselves onto other people and this is why we get very stuck in things and we don't you know i've mentioned before like if your life isn't what you want it to be it's on you so for example you know in my situation i was really resentful that i wasn't being promoted and i wasn't being recognized for all the good work i was doing but I was expecting my employees to know what I was doing. I wasn't telling them what I was doing. I wasn't showing them what I was doing. I wasn't you know, vocal about that. So how would they know? And it was only when I actually had an appraisal with my manager and I told her all the things that I'd been doing that I then got promoted. It's like, well, yeah, no shit. Like, obviously that was going to happen. Um, and so, you know, you can't expect people to to know things unless you kind of do something. You know, I changed jobs. I got promoted multiple times. I did something about it because that's what I wanted. Um, you know, I was taking responsibility for myself. I wasn't kind of expecting someone to just kind of, you know, promote me for for doing good work because, you know, you have to earn that. Um, and it's often lonely um, to be on your own and to not be in a relationship. So relationships are very difficult and they they require a lot of kind of, reflection and self-awareness and you know communication i'm so lucky that that my partner is good at communicating um most of the time not all the time most of the time because we can really kind of like talk about okay this is the reason why i behave like this you know this is what i mean i suppose i'm probably better at communicating this but he's very good at receiving it let's say that um you know so I can say I'm very aware of kind of the reasons why I'm the way I'm and I'm very kind of I notice it more now and I can kind of be like oh that was a bit of a complex of mine that's what got activated and and whilst it's valid and it's a valid response and you know you can't you can't invalidate your own emotions and, and not respect them they are irrational and they they are illogical and you know you do need to communicate that to the person so that you then can work through those difficulties and kind of work on you know trying to bring yourself down from that triggering without it actually flowing over onto the other person so it's a challenging one but it's worth the angst because you know life's lonely without being in a relationship with somebody else and it's really healthy for us and it helps us grow so i mean overall i have talked for ages but this book was great and i would definitely recommend it for anybody um because it it's really helped me actually um on my kind of path of becoming a better person and growing in in a kind of more evolved adult kind of way so you now i was kind of i was getting that myself already from all the other things that i've read but that that did really help particularly with my relationship that i was in you know it was a when it was my boyfriend actually that that was reading this and i wanted to read it as well he got a recommendation from somebody else and um and you know in the beginning of our relationship we did really struggle with our differences um so it was kind of like touched on a lot of things that we, we'd already worked through at that point. So it was very, very useful to kind of become again aware of that. So, yeah, I definitely recommend it.